the 20, 2018 Shangri-La Dialogue uh, Special Session 5 on the strategic implications of military capability development in the Asia-Pacific. Uh, please, please do find a seat if you're intending to stay in this session and we'll, uh, we'll make a start. I, I'm Tim Huxley, Executive Director of WWS Asia. Um, I'd like to, first of all, uh, introduce my panelists uh, for this session, and uh, then I'll make uh, opening remarks for a few minutes before I hand over to the panelists for uh, their opening comments for this session, and then we'll move on to a discussion in the time, uh, in the time remaining. Uh, to, to introduce my panelists on the... Uh, on my right here at, at the end, I'm very pleased to introduce Lieutenant General Hurley, uh, Deputy President of the Academy of Military Science, People's Liberation Army. Uh, General He is the leader of the Chinese People's Liberation Army uh, delegation to this Shangri-La Dialogue, and it's a privilege to have him on this uh, panel. Um, I'm also very pleased to uh, welcome Lieutenant General Angus Campbell, Chief of Defence Force designate uh, from Australia, and uh, he tells me that he will be confirmed in his position in, in just over a month's time. So, welcome. Uh, on my left, Jody Thomas, uh, Deputy Minister of National Defence uh, from Canada. Thank you very much for joining the panel. And uh, on, on my far left, uh, Senator Dan Sullivan uh, uh, from the Committee on uh, the Armed Services in the United States Senate. Thank you very much for joining us. So four um, very uh, senior panelists for this session. Uh, but before, going, before turning over to them, I'd like to make a few opening remarks. Um, this, this panel is particularly important from the perspective of the IISS. It's uh, a subject in which we are closely engaged. Indeed, we have... Uh, over the last year or so, been working on a proposal for a major research program on military capabilities in the Asia-Pacific uh, region, and we're planning to take that forward uh, in the coming months and hopefully to start work on it in earnest. Although, of course, we do have uh, 60 years of experience on working on uh, uh, military capabilities globally. Uh, we have a very active defense and military analysis program uh, based at our London headquarters, uh, who have for many years produced our military balance book, which has recently, as John Chipman remarked last night, uh, been transformed into uh, our electronic database, the Military Balance Plus. From our perspective, military capability is a complex phenomenon. Uh, it involves many more elements than simply the headline numbers relating to equipment holdings defense spending, and personnel strength. It's clear to us that factors such as national defense science and R&D capabilities, logistic support, military infrastructure, operational experience, training standards, leadership, morale, doctrine, and alliance relations and other forms of security partnership all contribute to military capability at the national level. But there's also an important question about military capability in terms of military capability for what? Military capability has little or no meaning in a vacuum. Each country maintains and attempts to develop military capability for a unique national set of purposes. Most obviously, some countries are more concerned with external threats, others primarily with internal challenges. In the Asia-Pacific region, it's clear that some countries have been making stronger efforts than others to develop externally oriented military capabilities that carry with them important implications for the security considerations of other states in the region. And of course, it's not just some regional states that are developing their capabilities. The most powerful military actor in the region is still the United States, and its efforts to enhance its Indo-Pacific capabilities are clearly making an impact on the region. One thing is clear, the distribution of military power in the region is, cha is changing significantly as a result of all these developments. 
to talk about the issues of military capability development in the region and its strategic implications. In this session, we have an excellent panel comprising very senior military practitioners and policy makers. Each of them uh, will make some brief opening comments, following which I sincerely hope that there'll be sufficient time for others in this session, uh, for our delegates uh, to make your own points and for us to have an open exchange about the developing uh, military capabilities of this region and their ramifications. To start off the discussion, I turn first to General Herle, uh, leader of the PLA delegation to this Shangri-La dialogue. General Herle. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a great pleasure of mine to have this opportunity to share with you my views on strategic implications of military capability development in the Asia Pacific. In recent years, the Asia Pacific region has witnessed a growing gap between economic development and security. On the one hand, its economy has maintained a steady and fast growth, making the region the most dynamic and promising area in the world. On the other hand, its security still faces many unstable and uncertain factors. Zero-sum competition is on the rise. Disputes over territorial sovereignty and the maritime rights and interests remain complex and difficult to resolve. And the non-traditional security threats, such as terrorism, natural disasters, and the transnational crime grow prominent. Such trend leaves Asia-Pacific countries with few choices but to increase their security investment and develop military strength in order to prevent possible emergencies, which to some extent add new variables to regional security. The long-term rapid growth of Asia-Pacific economy has benefited from the peaceful and stable regional environment. The gap between economic development and security will drive more resources to the security domain, which will be detrimental to healthy economic development. In the absence of strategic mutual trust, security dilemma is likely to intensify and eventually drag down economic growth. Therefore, it is imperative for the Asia-Pacific countries to review international security concepts taking shape since the end of the Cold War and to reassess regional security architecture in the hope of solving root causes of security problems and creating a favorable security environment for sustainable economic development. To ensure long-term stability and the prosperity of the Asia-Pacific, in recent years, China has put forward a number of proposals which have been highly valued and attracted attention from the international community. And they include the following. First, China advocates new security concepts that keep pace with the times. In the face of rapid regional integration, the old, old security concepts such as zero-sum game and the supremacy of force have become outdated. China advocates the concept of a common, comprehensive, cooperative and sustainable security, taking win-win cooperation as the core of new international relations based on partnerships instead of alliances, 
and strive to pursue a new path of security, which is built by all, shared by all, and win-win for all, and safeguarded by all. Secondly, I want to talk about promoting common growth. China advocates common development to consolidate economic foundation for peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific. Many security issues in this region are deeply rooted in development and cannot be resolved without economic development. Achieving common development is the fundamental guarantee of peace and stability. It is the master key to solve all kinds of security problems. China's efforts to promote common economic development are also aimed at fundamentally solving security issues. The One Belt and One Road initiative proposed by China is not only a path of development, but also a path of peace. It will not only bring opportunities to the economic development of regional countries, but also provide ideas and solutions for these countries to solve security issues. Thirdly, we need to improve and perfect the regional security framework. China advocates improving regional security architecture to lay a solid foundation for enduring peace and stability in the region. In the Asia Pacific, there are multiple security cooperation mechanisms led by ASEAN, platforms such as SCO and CICA. There are also military alliances which were created in history due to various historical reasons. Such a diversity makes it difficult to establish a unified security framework within the region in the short term. In this context, countries should continue dialogue and cooperation and steadily pursue a regional security architecture on the basis of accumulating consensus. China will continue to take non-traditional security cooperation as the focus, build up mutual trust from the easier part, and step-by-step step consolidate the foundation for building a regional security architecture. Fourthly, China calls on the countries to properly handle differences and disputes and to maintain the peaceful and stable environment in the region. Countries in this region should uphold the tradition of mutual respect and the peaceful coexistence, seek common ground while shelving differences, properly handle and peacefully resolve disputes through direct negotiation and consultation. We should not let the historical problems damage our regional development and cooperation, or to let these problems undermine our mutual trust. Before the relevant issues are resolved, all parties should conduct a dialogue, seek cooperation, manage the situation properly, prevent conflicts from escalating, and jointly maintain regional peace and stability. Now, I would like to share with you my views on the um, three major issues. First of all, on China's reform of national defense and the armed forces. As you all know that since 2015, China has embarked on its military reform, which goes roughly three through three phases. The first phase is the reform of the military leadership and the command system. The general principle established is that the Central Military Commission exercises overall leadership. Thereafter, commands are responsible for military operations and the military services focus on developing capabilities. 
Four general headquarters of the CMC were reorganized into 15 functional organs. We performed the services leadership and management system by establishing an army leading organ, the rocket force, and the strategic support force. We built and perfected the joint operations command system and and resized the seven military area commands and established five theater commands, eastern, southern, western, northern, and central. The second phase is to adjust and optimize the size and structure as well as the uh, composition of our forces. We cut the number of active personnel by 300,000, reducing the armed forces from 2.3 million to 2 million. We optimized the uh, proportion of each service and uh, reorganized 18 combined corps into 13. The proportion of army in the whole armed forces is now less than 50 percent. We streamlined the number of officers and uh, strictly limited the number of administrative organs and personnel. The ratio of officers and soldiers is significantly optimized. The third phase is on policy and system reform. We have deepened reforms in major policies and systems, such as officers' professionalization system and a civilian personnel system, and promote the revolution in military management. We will run the armed forces strictly according to law, fundamentally transform the way of governing troops, and raise the level for rule of law in national defense and armed forces building. We will deepen reform of our science, technology, and industry for national defense, strive for in-depth civil military integration, and build integrated national strategic system and strategic capabilities. Through the three phases of reform, Chinese military will realize system restructuring by 2020. By then, it will not, on, it will not only greatly improve its ability of safeguarding national security, but also shoulder more international responsibilities and obligations and provide more public security goods. Second, on the Korean Peninsula nuclear issues. Over the years, China's position has been very clear and consistent. China stays committed to the goal of denuclearization of nuclearization of the peninsula, upholding the peace and stability on the peninsula, and resolving the peninsula issue through dialogue and negotiation. Since the beginning of this year, we are pleased to see that the situation of the Korean Peninsula is moving in the right direction of the dialogue and pol political solution. A rare historical opportunity to realize a nuclear-free peninsula and establish a peace mechanism emerges. It has been proven that cyber rattling and um, confrontation can only make the issue more complicated. Dialogue and consultation are the fundamental solutions. We hope that the summit meeting between the DPRK and the U.S. will take place smoothly and produce positive results. And all parties concerned value the positive progress achieved recently, make more remarks that are good international and helpful to ease tensions, take more actions that are conducive to, conducive to further dialogue and mutual trust, remain committed to solving each other's concerns through dialogue and consultation, promote political resolution process, and make more contribution to the long-lasting peace and security on the peninsula. Finally, on the South China Sea issue, recently, as you know, that the U.S., in disregard of the effects, hyped up so-called military uh, militarization in the South China Sea and uh, took it as an excuse to disinvite China to the uh, RIMPAC 2018 joint military exercise. 
We take such move as neither constructive nor inclusive. China's participation in their RAMPAC military exercise is not only of great military significance, but of even more political significance. It is a symbol of a China-U.S. military mutual trust and cooperation. China and the U.S. should respect each other, meet each other halfway, and advance towards the grand goal of a China-U.S. cooperation. Nanshan Islands are undisputable territory of China. It is the natural right of China to carry out the constructions on its own inherent territory and to deploy necessary defense facilities. It is also a necessary measure to defend national sovereignty, security, and maintain regional peace and stability. The current situation in the South China Sea has calmed down visibly as a result of its joint efforts of China and ASEAN countries. The United States, in the name of freedom of navigation, sent out military vessels and aircrafts to the adjacent waters and airs of Chinese islands and reefs, challenging China's sovereignty and security. This is real militarization. This is also in contradiction with the consistent claims that on the South China Sea issue, the U.S. does not hold a position and does not choose size as to the sovereignty of the features in the South China Sea. Ladies and gentlemen, as a major power in the Asia Pacific, China knows that its peaceful development is closely related to the future, future of uh, Asia Pacific. China has always made it its mission to promote prosperity and stability in the region. China possesses a national defense policy that is defensive in nature and a military strategy of active defense. The Chinese Armed Forces is an advocate facilitator and a participant of international security cooperation committed to developing and promoting non-aligned, non-confrontational military cooperative relations that is not targeting at third party. It has infused strong positive energy into the world peace. Thank you. Gen General, thank you very much um, for your um, very interesting and uh, quite detailed presentation. We'll now move quickly to General Campbell. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and to join in this discussion. Uh, I am here representing the Chief of the Australian Defence Force, Air Chief Marshal Mark Binskin, who sends his apologies and wishes the IISS Shangla Dialogue all the very best in its now 17th year. And uh, we would both like to commend uh, Dr John Chipman, uh, Tim Huxley and the team who have put this together. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I give my uh, uh, remarks, I would just note that uh, respectfully, Australia does not uh, see the uh, South China Sea setting as General He has outlined. Uh, I'm not going to discuss that in any more detail now. It's a long-standing and well-articulated position, uh, but I want to move on to my remarks now. Uh, the Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull in the Introduction to Australia's 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper stated, change, unprecedented in its scale and pace, is the tenor of our times. Our region is the fastest growing in the world. It continues to see widespread economic transformation and increasing prosperity, which is lifting the living standards of billions of people. Combined also with unprecedented technological advancement, it is changing the face of the Indo-Pacific region that we all share. Consequent to the economic and technological transformation underway is the rapid modernisation of defence capabilities across the region. 
Such modernization can bring opportunity for all the countries represented here today. It might well allow greater ability to respond collectively to some of the common threats facing our region, including terrorism, maritime security issues, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. The Australian Defence Force also is benefiting from modernisation through the framework and policies established by the 2016 Defence White Paper, the Australian Government is investing in a lethal, technically sophisticated, capable and networked Australian Joint Force. This is being accompanied by commensurate attention to Australian defence industry and investment in innovation. The economic prosperity, technological advancement and rapid military transformation we see across the region can also manifest as strategic competition, sometimes heightening tension and the risk of miscalculation leading to conflict. Australia's Defence Force is focused and focusing on proactive strategies to shape and support the international rules-based order, which we have all benefited from. Demography dictates that our Defence Force will remain a relatively small military within the region and in, on global standards. Size, of course, can be deceptive, as uh, Tim mentioned. There's many things to consider when looking to understand capability. The professionalism and ability of our people, technical sophistication, ability to deploy joint forces, adaptability, the capacity and resolve to work with allies and partners in common interest, all come together when understanding and assessing capability. Like the nation we serve, the Australian Defence Force is a reliable and resilient partner. Through partnership and habitual cooperation, our region has flourished and strong regional security architecture has developed. It is imperative we maintain this in order to build trust, transparency and promote ongoing collaboration. Similarly, we believe the United States' continued robust commitment and presence in the Indo-Pacific is vital to the ongoing stability and security of the region. We should be alert to, but not surprised by, rapid modernisation as we see across the region. While the development of significant new military capabilities can lead to competition, as I've said, such outcomes are not assured. I do not subscribe to the inevitability of the so-called Thucydides trap. Such a concept is, I believe, flawed. It denies all of us, advisers and decision makers, presence and agency to act and the accountability for what we see and understand of the world we, uh, we live in today and how we respond to it. A stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific region cannot be taken for granted in the face of our Prime Minister's assertion of change unprecedented in its scale and pace. But we do have the relationships and extant security architecture required to address the strategic implications of such change. We can, and I believe we must, work collectively to meet common challenges, build understanding, transparency and trust. Thank you. Thank you very much, General, um, for providing uh, very succinctly uh, Australia's perspective on these uh, important issues. Thank you. And uh, I'd now like to ask Jody Thomas uh, to present uh, a view. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Huxley. Thank you to my fellow panelists. I'm honored to be here given the strong ties Canada has to the Asia Pacific region. More than one million Canadians are of Asian descent and more Canadian trade occurs across the Pacific Ocean than the Atlantic Ocean, testament to our strong economic ties. These strong ties make us natural partners to address shared security concerns in this region. Because no one nation can reverse climate change or single-handedly defeat terrorism or piracy. Instead, we rely on multilateral relations developed through international organizations and multilateral fora. This includes the United Nations and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations Regional Forum. And we hope to grow these relationships with more involvement in ASEAN-led fora, particularly ADMM+. These multilateral relationships are a priority for us, and that influenced the way we develop strong, secure, and engaged Canada's defence policy. 
Before we started writing, we conducted extensive consultations with more than 20,000 Canadians and with our allies and our partners. We needed to be open and transparent and to hear from our citizens and from the international community. We published the policy in its entirety when we launched it last year. And I'm proud to say that people are at its heart because military capability, military capabilities are nothing without the women and men who employ them. And one of the ways we are putting people first is through our use of gender-based analysis plus. This tool helps identify the potential impacts of our policies, programs and military operations could have on people of all identity factors. And we will rely on it as we develop our military capabilities. With the recent publication of the Defence Investment Plan, we've, we've been completely open about what those capabilities will be. This level of transparency helps sustain the rules-based international order, which is the foundation of global stability. This is especially important in the Asia-Pacific region, where oceans are central to national and global interests, which leads to massive investments in maritime capabilities, including ships and submarines. In some parts of the Asia-Pacific region, particularly, particularly the South China Sea, land reclamation and the building of outposts for military purposes have been supported by the deployment of advanced military capabilities without transparency. We are concerned over recent reports that offensive weapon systems have been deployed to disputed features in the South China Sea. I would specifically highlight the concern over land-based anti-ship cruise missiles and the surface-to-air missiles that were re recently placed on disputed features in the Spratly Islands. The development and deployment of military capabilities without transparency can have an escalatory and destabilizing effect on a region, leading to distrust, misperceptions and miscommunication, and possibly conflict. That has consequences for all of us. Economically, it disrupts trade. Militarily, it reduces our ability to address shared threats. And it reduces our ability to work together to respond to challenges like climate change, overfishing, or disaster preparedness and humanitarian response to hurricanes and tsunamis. That's why Canada seeks to promote regional maritime domain awareness, and it's why we have increased our engagement in this area. HMCS Vancouver is participating in multilateral exercises in the Asia-Pacific region, and later this summer, she'll head to RIMPAC. Within the last year, we co-hosted three important events for the ASEAN Regional Forum, the Defence Officials Dialogue, last May in Ottawa, a seminar on capacity building in support of UN peacekeeping support operations in December in Hanoi, and a workshop on chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear preparedness in March in Manila. The closer we work together, the more we see the benefits of these multilateral relationships. We can see the positive effects that increased cooperation on counterterrorism efforts have had in curbing extremism in this region. And multilateral exercises like Pacific Partnership 2018 have helped build interoperability between Pacific countries, Canada among them, and prepared us to respond to natural disasters in the region. The Malacca Straits patrols have strengthened counter counter piracy measures, and the joint patrols that Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines will conduct in the Sulu Sea are expected to make those waters safer. The military capabilities you are developing in the Asia Pacific region have great potential to enhance regional security, and they can make us more effective as we respond to threats and work together to protect the rules-based international order. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much uh, again for that very uh, succinct uh, summary of uh, your national position on those uh, military capability uh, issues and the way that uh, Canada, um, through various measures, is, is contributing to security in the, in the region. Um, for um, our fourth uh, brief set of comments, uh, I, I'd like to ask Senator Dan Sullivan to speak. Well, thank you, Dr. Huxley, and I want to thank everybody for joining us and the panelists today. I'm looking forward to a good, good discussion. I also want to thank IISS um, for the great work they've done and, importantly, the uh, government of Singapore, which has been a decades-long friend of many of the countries represented here. I just had the opportunity and honor to meet with the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister a couple hours ago, and uh, I want to thank them for all the work they're doing, not only on this conference, but importantly on the uh, what's looking like a very important upcoming meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un and all the hard work that Singapore has done that. 
I'll start. This is my third uh, Shangri-La dialogue. I was elected just three and a half years ago, so I tried to get out to the region quite a lot. Um, and I came here three years ago in 2015 with uh, the Senate delegation was then by a, a great American Senator John McCain, who uh, some of you might know is struggling with some serious health issues, but he sends everybody his greetings um, because uh, he's been a regular um, presence here representing the United States of America for decades at this conference. And uh, um, he's a great American, and we're all praying for his uh, recovery. But um, when we were here, I specifically remember some of the whispers, and even more than whispers, of what I would say were two themes three years ago, the idea of American decline um, and uh, the calling into question uh, our staying power in the Asia-Pacific. And to be honest, I think some of those, um, some of those uh, ideas that were throughout the conference uh, had some elements, of, uh, some elements of truth that were based on what I, said, what I would say were three areas that people were focused on. From 2010 to 2016, the United States had cut defense spending by 25% uh, due to the previous administration's lack of focus, due to what we call sequestration in the Congress. Um, we were, um, in 2015, cutting an additional almost 50,000 active duty forces from the U.S. Army. The U.S. Air Force was at its smallest number of airplanes in American history, and our Navy was shrinking. Um, we had an economy three years ago that hadn't hit 3% GDP growth in 10 years, was growing at about 1%, uh, one and a half in a good year. We even had a new name for it, the new normal. Uh, American officials were calling it, saying this is what we're able to do uh, as a country, 1%, one and a half percent GDP growth. And there was criticisms that we weren't focused on the region, that even though there was a so-called pivot, that most of the focus, uh, despite a declining military budget, was still on the Middle East, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, in other areas. Fast forward three years uh, to di today, and I think it's a, it's a very different story. As a matter of fact, I'm reminded of the uh, anecdote from the great American writer Mark Twain, who had a, uh, was reported ill, and uh, there was an obituary in the newspaper that actually said he had died. And a reporter asked him about it when he saw it, and he said, quote, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. So uh, that was Mark Twain. What's going on right now uh, with regard to the U.S. in this region? First, our economy is growing. We've been undertaking policies that are very focused on growing the U.S. economy. Uh, there are estimates that we're going to be this year hitting 3 possibly 4 percent GDP growth, hopefully leaving the whole concept of the new normal in the rearview mirror where it belongs, in my view. Uh, another area related to our economy is we've unleashed the opportunity and promise of American energy, where we are once again um, either the largest or soon to be largest producer of oil on the planet. We are the largest producer of natural gas. We're the largest producer of renewables. And that is going to continue into the future. Uh, we have, are very focused on the Asia Pacific. And for those of you who saw Secretary Mattis's speech this morning, he talked about it as the priority theater. Uh, this is also reflected in our national security strategy from the Trump administration, the national defense strategy, which our Congress required of the uh, Department of Defense, and um, the whole focus on the challenges and opportunities with regard to the rise of China. This is an intense focus right now in the United States executive branch and in the Congress, and you're seeing American diplomacy and leadership, uh, in particular as it relates to North Korea, and finally trying to addre address what uh, Lieutenant General Hur mentioned and we share Certainly China and the United States is a nuclear-free Korean peninsula with our allies, Japan and Korea. That strategy is also very focused, and you heard Secretary Mattis talk about um, the importance of re-engaging with our allies throughout the world, particularly in this region, and, and we have been very focused on that. But importantly for this session, um, I do want to mention that there's been a very significant turnaround with regard to our focus on military spending uh, in the United States. We just passed uh, in, the National in the Senate Armed Services Committee the National Defense Authorization Act, 
We'll be bringing that to the floor of the Senate in the next two weeks. That is a massive, uh, and in my view, much needed turnaround from the 25 percent defense cuts uh, during the second term of the Obama administration. Uh, this year we are authorizing, and I can go through the weapons systems and their R&D, but uh, $716 billion for the next fiscal year in terms of uh, military spending. We are rebuilding our end strength in all our services, uh, significantly focusing on R&D, uh, significantly focusing on um, the goal of a 355-ship Navy, which will have significant impact on the Asia-Pacific. So that's just in three years. And so I think that that is important. Secretary Mattis also talked about the issue, and I just wanted to touch on it, of staying power uh, in the region. Uh, as an Alaskan, as Alaska senator, I don't even talk about being in the region. I talk about we are an Asia-Pacific country. We don't come out here. We are in this part of the world. My hometown of Anchorage, Alaska, is closer to Tokyo than it is to Washington, D.C. And as Secretary Mattis mentioned, We've seen waves of different um, groups come and go in this part of the world. Uh, European colonialism in the 1800s, uh, fascism, which of course um, overtook this part of uh, the globe during World War II, Soviet expansionism after World War II, and in every single case, the United States was here to promote prosperity, freedom, security, and if we had to defeat totalitarianism, which we've done. So we've been in the region for 200 years since the founding of the Republic, and we will be in the region for another 200 years. We are an Asia-Pacific country. Let me end by going a little bit more um, tactical with regard to this issue of the freedom of navigation, not just the South China Sea, but what it means to the United States. I was recently in China, in Beijing, for senior level meetings. As a matter of fact, I had a very good meeting with Lieutenant General Her's uh, boss, the Minister of Defense in China. And of course, China talks a lot about their 5,000 year history, which all of us should respect because it's very, very impressive. I heard a lot about that in my meetings uh, the last couple of days in Beijing. But there's also an element of American history. And of course, we're a young country but it's literally in our DNA to be focused on the freedom of navigation. If you look at the founding documents of the United States, uh, the Declaration of Independence, uh, that is very focused on the freedom of navigation. If you look at the first global deployment of U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, uh, so, uh, Marines in our Navy, it was to defend the freedom of navigation against Barbary pirates in the Mediterranean. That's etched into the first line of the Marines' hymn, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. That was in 1803. The first Article I of the U.S. Constitution focuses on this. So this is something that we have done for decades. It's something that we will continue to do for decades. It's something that we believe has benefited the entire globe, keeping sea lanes open. And it's not just in the South China Sea where we do freedom of navigation operations. Uh, Jody might be surprised that we've actually even done them uh, with regard to Canada and other countries. And we believe that every country, including and especially China, has benefited from these type of freedom of navigation operations. Uh, as Secretary Mattis mentioned, unfortunately, when President Xi Jinping was at the White House in 2015 and he said he will not militarize, China will not militarize the South China Sea, uh, we believe that that promise, unfortunately, wasn't kept. And that's unfortunate. But we are, what we are going to do is we're going to continue to fly, sail, and operate everywhere international law allows us, because we think that has benefited every single country in this uh, conference, including China. And as the Secretary mentioned, we're going to continue to offer strategic partnerships in the region, not strategic dependence. And I think that's an important difference, but we're going to continue to do that with a strong economy, a strong military, strong alliances, and uh, keep Mark Twain's words in mind the next time you hear about American decline or lack of commitment to the Asia Pacific. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, uh, we really appreciate your 
your presentation and uh, your um, your comments on how um, America's posture has has changed since since uh, three years ago. That's very useful. Um, we now have approximately 45 minutes for questions and uh, and discussion. Um, I hope none of you will mind if I start the discussion off myself. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of points that came up in those, those presentations which um, I might ask uh, two of our, uh, our panellists to clarify in the interests, um, uh, in the interests of uh, transparency and uh, uh, deeper understanding. For, first of all, Ge General Herr, can I, can I ask you about this uh, issue of uh, uh, the uh, deployment of um, missiles on uh, the territories um, that you describe as Chinese territories um, in the South China Sea? Um, you, mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned this in your own uh, presentation, but in the interest of transparency and understanding. I wonder if you could um, talk briefly about the uh, strategic rationale uh, for those uh, deployments, because of course military capability isn't just about uh, the development of military capability in a technical sense, it's also about how it's used and, and deployed, and I think it would be, it would be really um, valuable if you could um, give us some uh, insights uh, from your perspective on that. And uh, secondly, I, I'd like to ask Senator Sullivan uh, about the goal of the 355-ship Navy that you mentioned, which is um, a, a, very, uh, it's a very substantial goal, and I know that, that questions have been asked about the timescale for that, and I wonder if you might be able to uh, say something about what, what, is, uh, what is your view of, of, of when that... Uh, might be achievable because there is, I think in the expert community at least, there is some skepticism about that objective. So uh, first, if I might ask uh, General Herr about the uh, issue of the missile deployment in the South China Sea. Uh, Thank you for your question. So the question is about China, South China Sea. This morning, when I met the reporters and the journalists, I shared with them my views on South China Sea. And at the discussion here, I, was, I am asked this question once again. So I would like to share with you our views on this issue. First of all, I have to make a declaration. South China Sea, all the islands, as well as all the neighboring seas, are a part of China, China's territory. As I was, and we have um, historical records to prove, and it is also recognized by international law. It is an undisputable fact. Secondly, so all these years, China has uphold to our principle of while respecting the historical fact and international laws through conducting communications and negotiations with all the parties related and through a peaceful measure to resolve all the disputes and issues. Thirdly, I am also happy to tell you that in the recent years, China and ASEAN countries have been working together, and the South China Sea now is peaceful and stable, and it doesn't exist any so-called lack of freedom of navigation in this region. So this is my answer to the first part of your question. The second question is about the deployment uh, it's about the construction of uh, the islands in South China Sea. So while you are all aware of the context, for as for the old islands and the neighboring seas, they are part of China's territory. And uh, it is um, 
our right to construct any facilities in our own territory. It is international matter, and it is also allowed by international laws. I personally, in February of 2015, paid visits to seven islands in the South, uh, South China Sea. I personally witnessed the construction of uh, facilities in South China Sea. I can tell you responsibly that our construction in the South China Sea on all the islands are serving for the following three purposes. Number one, it is for the purpose of improving the living conditions of all the, uh, um, all the soldiers there that are stationed on the islands. Number two, the functions of uh, these uh, Facilities are civil purposes, not for military purposes. Number three, all the engineering and the construction on the islands can provide common products or public products to the security and stability of South China Sea. For example, for all the airplanes and uh, and the vessels, we can provide services uh, such as na uh, navigation, the watering, so on and so forth. We can also provide uh, the um, emergency services in case of a, uh, in case of a disasters. We can also provide uh, supplies to the vessels passing by. So these are the three purposes that these constructions are serving for. I believe that everybody here. Perhaps I am the only person who has been to the uh, seven islands and eight construction points. Nobody else here. So as for the construction on the islands, you cannot believe in the rumors. I would suggest that you go there and have a look by yourself so that you can come to a, a true and real conclusion. The third point I want to make is that the so-called militarization of uh, the islands in South China Sea. It is um, undeniable that while we construct the islands in South China Sea, there are soldiers that are stationed on the islands. And meanwhile, there are also, there are also um, weapons and weapons deployed there. So it is a symbol of China's sovereignty. Think about it. No matter what country it is, so as it is on your own territory, you can deploy soldiers, you can deploy armies, you can deploy uh, weapons, and it is the matter of international sovereignty. So any, any, uh, any. Um, Irresponsible comments from other countries can not be accepted. I remember in the 1980s, at that time, Hong Kong ha had just returned back to China. And uh, at that time, there was a discussion whether mainland China should deploy armies in Hong Kong. At that time, Mr. Deng Xiaoping said that we must deploy armies in Hong Kong because it is a symbol of China's sovereignty. So if we apply the same words by Deng Xiaoping to the current situation today, by deploying weapons and soldiers on the islands of, uh, of uh, South China Sea, it is also a symbol of China's sovereignty. In addition to this, I also remember that a couple of days ago, Mr. Wang Yi, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, said that if such deployment of um, military forces is not allowed to deploy on the islands of uh, South China Sea, then if another country deploys weapons and uh, soldiers on on these islands, and then it is also a kind of uh, militarization. Now in Hong Kong, 
we have weapon deployment, we have um, army deployment. So do you think that it is a militarization as well? So just as um, Mr. Moderator said that on the islands, we have deployed this type of a weapon, that type of a weapon. I think that no matter what weapon we have deployed on those uh, islands, they are for their national defense purpose. We have uh, deployed uh, soldiers and uh, weapons on those islands. As I said before, they are not targeting any other countries. So you may wonder, if they are not targeting at other, any other countries, why bother deploying uh, such weapons and uh, soldiers? Actually, it is uh, for the sake of uh, defending ourselves. All the weapons and, uh, and the soldiers, they are for the purpose of avoiding being evaded by others. So we have to be prepared for preventing being, pre uh, being invaded. And also, some countries, they use their own military vessels and uh, aircrafts to poke China in the um, in Chinese waters and airs for um, for military activities, and uh, even within the uh, even they uh, came to the uh, to the islands that are within the um, uh, 12 marine miles to show their military power. It is not a matter of um, freedom of uh, navigation. It is uh, a, uh, it is uh, a damage. It is uh, a, 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 um, a kind of a ch challenge of uh, China's uh, sovereignty. So as a matter of fact, it is exactly the root of uh, the militarization of uh, South China Sea. If such military vessels and aircrafts coming to our islands or the neighboring seas within their 12 marine time miles, this will definitely encourage China's more efforts on enhancing our construction of such islands. So it is not a solution to any question, uh, any issues for some countries. The uh, military vessels and the aircrafts coming to China in our waters and the seas and, uh, for detection. And they also come to our islands within the 12 maritime miles to challenge China's uh, sovereignty. We are strongly against uh, these activities, and uh, we have to take firm measures to stop them. Talking about freedom of navigation, China, as well as all the other countries in the world, um, seek freedom of navigation. We welcome freedom of navigation. We all hope that uh, we will face no obstructions in freedom of navigation based on the laws. And I can tell you that Under the joint efforts of China and ASEAN countries in South China Sea, currently there is no problem with freedom of navigation. May I ask all the delegates here, has any of your countries, has any of your commercial vessels from your countries encountered problem with freedom of navigation in the South China Sea? Has any of your military vessels in South China Sea, followed by following the international laws when you navigate in that part of the ocean, have been encountered with any obstruction efforts. Last year, when I attended the 16th Shangri-La Dialogue, and this year, I'm attending the 17th Shangri-La Dialogue. I have also attended other similar international conferences and dialogues. I have never, during those conferences, heard anyone mention that their commercial vessels or military vessels being stopped or being obstructed when they navigate the South China Sea. However, military Aircrafts should not 
fly close to the border or within 12 nautic miles of other countries' uh, sovereignty zones, that is uh, not grounded. There's no legal ground for that. So the interpretation of freedom of navigation is an issue that we could further discuss. I wonder if my answer is uh, satisfactory to, uh, to you and to the chairman. Thank you. I think you've made China's position very clear. Uh, Dr. Huxley, thank you. I, I ju just, to, just to comment very quickly, I know we want to move on to other uh, topics, but uh, Lieutenant General Herr's um, uh, response, I just want to mention, you know, freedom of navigation, open lanes of commerce, um, it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. It's underwritten typically by a Navy, and the United States Navy has underwritten that for the world for the last 70 years. And if you don't have that out there doing it, not just in the South China Sea, not just with regard to China, but other countries, as I mentioned, even Canada, um, in areas where there's some uh, dispute, uh, you do have problems. So I think the notion that somehow this just happens um, organically in the oceans has been proven wrong by history. Secondly, respectfully to Lieutenant General Hur, I don't think um, China's claims are recognized by international law, the Nine Dash Line or others. To the contrary, uh, I think they're not. And third, one area where I, where I do agree with him, you know, that this isn't an area where it needs to be hyped, and I would agree with that. I think Secretary Mattis has put forward a strategy where we're, we're doing this on a regular basis, hopefully with allies, not just in the South China Sea. We're not putting out press releases or anything. But I will note when the H-60 bomber recently landed at Woody Island, um, the PLA actually did put out a press release about the bomber and said it was being landed there uh, to prepare for the war in the South China Sea. So I mentioned this to the defense minister in Beijing that that sounds a lot like hype. So we shouldn't hype this, but press releases that talk about some, you know, things like that, I think, uh, aren't very helpful either. But I would agree that we shouldn't be hyping this, and that's where I think China and the U.S. Uh, have some agreement on this issue. Um, you mentioned the question on the 355-ship Navy. We recognize it's, a, it's big, it's ambitious, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, it is in the law uh, that we would do that. This, this NDAA authorizes um, just for the next fiscal year uh, close to 26 billion with regard to shipbuilding. We think that can uh, cover hopefully two, um, or I'm sorry, 10 uh, different classes. I can go into the different classes of ships that that could cover. But very importantly, for the last two years, what we have been doing through our annual National Defense Authorization Act, which really goes to this broader topic of how quickly, because we have, we have it in law, but we don't have the timeline is we are significantly reforming our acquisition um, and uh, military equipment um, program in terms of uh, research and development, but getting uh, systems out to the fleet. We've had some real uh, challenges. The F-35, some of you might know, uh, has taken, depending on how you measure it, anywhere from 17 to 20 years. Uh, the Ford-class carrier as a $2 billion overrun with regard to these uh, new class of uh, U.S. carriers. So we're learning, but we are reforming what, in my view, has been a very broken acquisition process that has delayed weapon systems very significantly. But the commitment and the bipartisanship in the Congress for doing this, I believe, is there. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, we, we have about 25 minutes left. Um, if you'd like to uh, make a point or um, put a question to one of the panelists or, or uh, put a point up for consideration by the, the whole panel, please could you put your name board up, uh, up vertically so I can see it. Um, is that Ewan? Ewan Graham. Thank you, Tim. Um, Ewan Graham from the Lowy Institute. My question is for Lieutenant General um, Angus Campbell. Um, General Campbell, um, 
Australia is um, making significant investments, as you've noted, in, in modernization of its capabilities, uh, which are now feeding in, in a, I think, in a very um, visible and real way. And if you excuse, excuse the plug, we at the Lowy Institute have recently published a, an Asian power index, which includes several composite measures of power, but including military capability. And the, the good news is that Australia, of the 25 nations uh, we, uh, we ranked, um, uh, comes ninth. Uh, and uh, I think no embarrassment in, in the countries that it's, uh, that it's behind in that region. Um, but it ranks ninth um, above Singapore, but only just. Um, perhaps the point that that insinuates is that military capability is not quite the same as, as military capacity. And if we're looking at engagements that Australia does, um, we are uh, much more modestly uh, equipped with a, 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 an authorized, well, a, a full uniform strength of 60,000, which is, in regional terms, um, quite modest. Uh, so I wondered where you stood in your prospective role as Chief of Defence Force on the question of um, where Australia needs to uh, apportion its pieces of the pie in defence engagement. There is an on-running debate about um, whether we can continue to uh, send forces on deployment regularly to the Middle East, uh, or whether we need, in fact, to um, prioritise and husband our resources for the near um, regions of the Pacific uh, and Southeast Asia. Um, so I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on that. Uh, Ewan, thanks very much for the question. Uh, look, could I start by noting that while I'm here um, uh, representing our Chief of Defence Force, there can be only one king and I am not it uh, or him at the moment. So I'm going to speak as the Chief of the Army, uh, which is my substantive appointment, and simply note that, uh, yes, Australia has a modestly sized force if you look across the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is our home, and uh, we take very, very seriously our responsibility to be a part of our home and to seek to promote and to build the international rules-based order that we are all prospering from, all of us. There are, for all our countries, issues and interests uh, that on occasions are beyond our home, uh, further afield. And these are considered and measured and, uh, and uh, taken action by uh, our governments as they uh, see our interests require. Uh, but always it's home where we look to consider uh, the long game and the, uh, the ultimate uh, architectures of our force and our national interest and uh, the way in which Australian power more broadly is engaged to positively influence uh, the world. Uh, so with regard then to uh, how might we be an active participant, I, I would look to... Uh, our history and just note that uh, Australia has never conducted unilateral operations. Uh, we have always found ourselves partners uh, of common interest in coalitions, alliances and uh, uh, groupings of countries uh, pursuing both the values and the, the purposes that uh, bind those common interests. And that is a powerful statement, I think, of uh, where we should understand our past and our, our today and our future. Stronger together, understanding how we might uh, promote that international order that is to all our benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. Uh, maybe we could take the next question, the next maybe four or five questions as a as a batch, um, it's Alice Ekman. Uh, sorry about this. My question is to General Ho. Um, General Ho, many thanks for your very interesting and straightforward presentation. You underline China's uh, uh, new security concept and China's vision for the region in particular as the aim to uh, develop a new security architecture in Asia, 
uh, step by step. I wonder to what extent China's history can help us understand this new security concept and this new security architecture in the Asia-Pacific region. As some of you mentioned, China has a long history, long culture. In particular, I'm thinking of China's imperial tributary system and the concept of uh, Tianxia under heaven that a lot of Chinese scholars are referring to now. To what extent this is a source of inspiration to build a new security architecture in the Asia-Pacific region? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, next, uh, Lucy Beirosudro. Thank you, Tim. Um, I have a question that relates to something that has been mentioned by all panelists, and in particular by Mrs. Thomas, as, uh, the issue of transparency. Um, uh, I'm not just saying this because transparency would make my job easier in collecting data for the military balance. Um, but I was wondering, as uh, it has been said that lack of trust could create security dilemmas, and transparency is a tool to solve this and, and build on trust among countries. Do you think it would be possible to develop or uh, yeah, push further uh, transparency mechanisms in the region uh, for countries to share information about their military activities and modernization? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mike Yeo. Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Huxley. My question is for General He. Um, now, you asserted that the South China Sea is China's territory, but um, without going into detail, the International Tribunal a few years back ruled that the South China Sea islands and features do not belong to anyone. So what do you have to say about that? Thank you. Uh, Johan. <coughs> yes, um, question for... <coughs> Senator Sullivan on the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act. Um, what, uh, what exactly would this entail, um, specifically in, in regards also to capacity building for regional countries? Thank you. And sorry, I can't, I can't quite read your name. My eyesight's not very well, good. Well, as a matter of fact, there's Ho Yong, and then it's not, it must not be easy to, to read my name from afar, so it's two syllables, Ho Yong. Well, my question and comment goes to, uh, MS, I'm sorry, Senator Sullivan. And uh, Senator Sullivan talked about three and a half years of him having been, having been a senator. And then during those three and a half years, then I used to be ambassador, Korea's ambassador in Washington, D.C. And one of the pleasures of being an ambassador during that period of time was, of course, to come and meet with um, Senator Sullivan. I keep on saying Ambassador Sullivan. But, but anyhow, it is such a pleasure and honor to, to associate myself with your activities at the Senate. And then I was listening to you, and I said to myself, three and a half years is a long enough time to bring important changes. That, I was listening to you, and then that, in fact, was a very, very strong impression, impression which has been left in my, in my mind. Three and a half years, it can be a long time. You said U.S. economic growth, it, it grew from 1% to 3%, huge. And then you said it, uh, U.S. defense spending, it used to be $600 billion, now it is more than $700 billion, it's huge. Three years ago, then uh, pivot to Asia, it was just a rhetoric, but now it is more than a rhetoric. And I have to say, three and a half years ago, then uh, Senator Sullivan was a new senator, but now he's a very influential senator. <laughs> so three and a half years can bring many important changes. And then at the same time, what does it all come down to? All of it comes down to what your conclusion, that is to say, don't question about U.S. staying power. U.S. is not a declining power. You don't question about U.S. staying power. That, I think, is your conclusion. And then all of those, that economic growth and defense spending and, and then your strategy, you, in fact, were using them as an illustration to support your conclusion, which is don't question about U.S. staying power. And then that, in fact, is something which will be much appreciated by a large number of countries around the table in the sense that well, this is something I often said as an ambassador in Washington, D.C., which is that let us just think about the meaning of the past 70 years. That in human history, 5,000 years of human history, that 70 years was a unique period of peace, prosperity, and stability. And then much of it, in fact, we owe to the leadership role, very important leadership role, which have been played by the United States. 
So having said all of that during the past three and a half years, then of course when you say don't question about U.S. staying power, then of course it's much appreciated by me, but at the same time by a large number of people around, around this table. Having said that, let me be a devil's advocate. And then you'd be disappointed if I, I don't play that role this, this afternoon. Let, let me be your devil's advocate. Which is, well, I listen to you very carefully, but at the same time, I think many people around this table would be still thinking this, which is that somehow I cannot completely share this idea, this feeling, this, uh, this uh, uh, well, in a sense, not, not something which we can easily well, throw away, which is somehow... U.S. leadership, the quality of U.S. leadership, this, in fact, is not what it used to be five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. That, in fact, would be something which a large number of people would be feeling around the table. And then what is the reason about that? And then th this is what I'm telling you. That feeling about the quality of U.S. leadership, it is not because of uh, U.S. economic growth. It is not because of U.S. defense spending. It is about something else, which is... And then I was, uh, I was uh, listening to M Mr. Huxley rather closely, and then what he said was that, well, capability is important, but at the same time, intention to use that capability is equally or even more important. And then maybe the reason why, when we heard about what you had to say about the U.S. economy, about U.S. defense spending, about U.S. foreign policy, still there are a large number of people who are still concerned about the quality, quality of U.S. leadership, and I think it may be because of it, in the sense that, well, of course, in 2016, there was a presidential election, and then somehow that year, then somehow uh, we were exposed to a large number of Americans expressing their view. Well, after so many years, after the end of the Cold War, maybe the United States must, in fact, be making an important change from what we, we, what we have been perceiving our, our role in, in the international community should be like. I mean during the Cold War period, then of course it made a lot of sense for the United States to in fact be allocating so much of our, of our resources for, in order to maintain the alliance system, in order to play the leadership role. But after so many years after, after the Cold War, then maybe this is about the time that, that we should be, th in, in fact, have fundamental rethinking about our alliance system, about the quality of our leadership, et cetera, et cetera. And that, I think, may have something to do with why, after, have, after having listened so closely to what you had to say, there is still this lingering feeling about the prospect of U.S. leadership around the table. Thank you. But still, I very much enjoyed your, your, your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was quite a wide range of questions, and I think there was, there was a question there for almost... Uh, every one of our panelists, um, could, uh, Jody Thomas, um, uh, this question of uh, uh, this question of transparency. May, would you like to respond to that? Certainly. Thank you. I, I think it's uh, it's evident from my presentation the approach Canada has taken that we believe transparency is the cornerstone of relationships and alliances and that uh, we all benefit through open dialogue um, and transparency about both capacity, capability, and intention. Uh, I, I, I would like to pick up on two points that Senator Sullivan made. One, 355 ship Navy. It's pretty open and transparent. He's telling us exactly what the United States is going to do. I actually applaud that, and I respect it enormously. And he also said, um, essentially, that uh, friends don't always agree, but they can talk in an open and transparent manner and resolve issues. Um, I think if you understand where all the cards are being played at any given time. And I think that is uh, another cornerstone of alliances and relationships, and I think it's critical in the world order that we're existing in today. Thank you very much. Um, Senator, Senator Sullivan, um, there, there was a, a, a good question about the Asia Reassurance Initiative, and I wonder if you could, if you could say something about that. And, and then, of course, um, uh, the, the question about um, American, a broader question about American leadership. 
So the uh, Asia Reassurance Initiative is, uh, the idea is a broader base strategy that um, has three pillars. It's a security element, and that relates to security in the, in the region. We have um, many different initiatives with ASEAN countries, the uh, Maritime Security Initiative, uh, um, working with our partners and alliances. It talks about uh, trade and economics, both bilateral and multilateral. There's a number of us in the Congress who thought um, moving out of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership um, was a strategic mistake, and we have been engaging with the White House on looking at opportunities to re-engage on either that multilateral or bilateral basis. And the third pillar is a rule of law that goes to issues like freedom of navigation, um, uh, a rules-based international order that um, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Campbell has been uh, focusing on in his remarks. So it's got a bunch of details, but the, the broader point is to, it's bipartisan. It's very bipartisan right now in the, in the Senate. I'm one of the co-sponsors, is to establish an actual um, uh, framework and law so it would bring more stability to our strategy in the region that, does, that wouldn't fluctuate so much between different administrations. So that's, um, that's uh, the basis of that. And we can provide you more detail. We actually did a press conference a couple hours ago, Senator uh, Gardner and Senator Perdue and I. Um, Ambassador, thank you for your very kind words. And um, you have been a great, great advocate for your country. Uh, and you did a phenomenal job in Washington, and you've been a great friend of the United States. Uh, just to be clear, I, I didn't say don't question um, our resolve. I'm, I'm fine with people questioning U.S. resolve. It's very common, and um, what, what I, my message was more, uh, don't count us out. Um, people who have bet against the United States previously, when we've gone through very difficult times, um, have usually not done so well betting. And um, who knows, right? But uh, right now in my country, there's a lot of kind of a look back on a 50-year anniversary of the year 1968. And if you think, now I was only four years old, but if you think there's uh, turmoil and uh, division in our country Right now, just look back at what was, what was going on in 1968 in America. The Vietnam War was at its height. You had political chaos. The president decided he wasn't going to run for re-election, Lyndon Johnson. You had riots. You had the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy. I mean, you had a, an America that was really reeling. And there was a lot of people who thought we were going to retrench and leave the Asia Pacific, leave, um, leave the world. And, um, you know, my country, uh, we're certainly not perfect, but what we do have is a pretty strong ability to renew ourselves. And it can take some time, and uh, it's not always pretty. And as Jody mentioning, it's super transparent, so everybody sees it, and it can be kind of disconcerting to our allies. But I think what happened in the election of 2016, it was a surprise. Um, but I honestly believe uh, it was almost all about uh, one of the issues I've been talking about, economics, and um, where millions of Americans were starting to believe that the American dream, which we hold dearly uh, in our country, and you've spent a lot of time there, you know that, it's the whole idea that, look, your kids are going to do better than you, you did. You come over here, you work hard, you play by the rules, and your children are going to go farther than you did. And I think for millions of my fellow Americans, people started to believe that wasn't the case. And so that election was a little bit of a roll of the dice uh, in a lot of people's eyes. But I think it was driven by, um, we had, like I said, over 10 years of very anemic growth. And if you looked at the coasts of America, the East Coast and West Coast, Washington, D.C., Boston, San Francisco, L.A., those places were growing fine. Two, three, four, five, six percent GDP growth, a lot of opportunity. The middle of the country, in many ways, opportunities were not just stagnating, they were shrinking. And so to me, what we're trying to do right now is renew ourselves. 
And it can be disconcerting. It can be a little bit uh, hard to follow. But I think at the end of the day, we're going to come out and we're going to be fine. And um, I think we're going to be renewed in terms of our confidence. And what this region needs more than anything, what the rest of the world needs more than anything, is a confident America. Because when we're confident, I think we make better policies. When we're fearful, when we're kind of... um, when, when we feel things are going really, really poorly, um, you can retrench, you can make policy decisions that uh, I think have negative implications for long-term security alliances. So we're going through one of these renewal periods, and I think it's going to turn out well, but you put your finger on it, right? There's some questions that not just our allies have, but Americans have, but I think... Um, We've been through this before, and I think, again, people who are counting us out, whether in terms of our growth or whether in terms of leadership in the Asia-Pacific region, um, I wouldn't bet on it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Senator, um, for that, uh, uh, I think, rightly optimistic response. Um, Finally, I'd like to turn to... Uh, General Hurley, Um, there were uh, several questions for him, but I think uh, it would it would be very useful for us if if in your uh, your your final response you could focus particularly on the uh, the question from Dr. Ekman uh, on this question of whether China's history can uh, help us understand China's new security concept, which I think is a, a, a very important question. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for your question. So this is um, a very good question indeed. And uh, I can tell that, uh, so this is a a doctor, right? Yeah, it's a very knowledgeable question. And you must be a very knowledgeable person. And you must be very interested in Chinese history. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for uh, being interested in Chinese history. I was taught by the moderator this afternoon that because the PLA, our delegation, coming to Singapore here for the 17th Shangri-La Dialogue, we, it is a pity that we didn't have a chance to speak at the plenary session. And uh, I must thank the moderator for giving me more opportunities to speak at the at session five. So as for your question from this uh, doctor, so how to understand the uh, the uh, our national policy is um, defensive dis- defense type of a defense policy based on the Chinese history. So th- uh, tonight there will be a dinner. The president of um, Singapore will will hold a dinner to receive to receive all the delegates. So that's why I don't want to hold you here too long. China has five thousand years of uh, civilization, and uh, China is. A yeah, civilized ancient country, and there is a long, long history. And uh, among the 200 countries in the world, China is the only one that has um, a continuous history without any uh, breaking of its um, breaking out of its uh, history. If you look back the uh, thousands of years of a uh, of a civilization, this uh, your thought that has been in place all the time. That is harmony is the most important thing. Harmony can also be understood as peaceful, uh, as peace. And uh, I heard that uh, the uh, the Mr. Chen is uh, the, uh, um, the in the officer from the defense defense department. He he said that Chinese people when they when they eat they use a pair of uh, chopsticks. You have, must hold the uh, two pieces of sticks together so that you can pick up any food and uh, send it to your mouth. It is a uh, uh, harmony of uh, two pieces of sticks. So this is uh, the perhaps uh, the original, one of the origins, how we have this uh, word, the harmony. And uh, in the Western world, people use a fork and a lift, and you cut the piece of uh, meat with a knife, and it's kind of a tearing off, cutting off. It's a totally different types of uh, mentality or philosophy. So just as uh, told by Mr. Chen, I told him that you actually understand Chinese much better than I do. For thousands of years, 
There was the Chinese saying that we should not do to others what you don't want others to do to you. So you should not be overly aggressive. For thousands of years, this has been the tradition and the culture that the Chinese pass on to their generations. And our generation still remember this dearly. Our next generation and the generation after next will continue and inherit these values. I joined the army 50 years ago. That's about half a century. I am a professional military guy. But I do have one regret. For the past five decades serving in the army, I never actually fought in a war. China didn't fight any wars for decades. We are not expansionist. We do not invade other countries as a result of never fought in a war. It's a great regret for me as a military person. But I am proud that our country, China, has adhered to the uh, a policy of a diplomacy that is focused on peace. We have a defensive national defense strategy, and we have a proactive defense strategy. I am retiring soon. As a military person in peace times, I feel deeply proud. For the interest of time, I will uh, stop here. I hope you are satisfied. Much. Uh, thank you very much for that final comment, uh, and also for your your engagement in this in this session, which we which we appreciate, and indeed to uh, uh, our other panelists, to General Campbell, to Ms. Thomas, and to Senator Sullivan. Uh, thank you for joining this panel. Um, I think we had a wide, a, a very wide ranging discussion. Um, it did. Uh, it was not only concerned with military capability, but broader regional security issues. Um, and uh, thank you to all our participants. And uh, sorry, do you wish to make a point? Uh, we, we, we need to close this session really, quite, really now because uh, the panelists have other engagements, so we can't really linger. But if you wish to say something very quickly, please go ahead. Um, this is not a question. But this is just a response to General He. Oh, sorry, we can't. We can't have a. Res we, we we really don't have time for response. Maybe you no. could meet him. Maybe you could meet him afterwards and uh, and and speak to him then. Okay. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for your participation and uh, have a good dinner this, this evening. Thank you.